That boy said I could turn a boy into the man. Six God. I'm about to cyber bully again. Drake is one of the most interesting characters to do case studies on because dude has so much. He's attained so much in his 10 years plus in music. You'd think that there's nothing more that he could say to surprise people, but here we are. And I know the idea of doing any kind of case study on a human being is a little foreign to most folks as they would never try to do so with themselves. And doing so with an artist is extremely dehumanizing. If you watch Drake's newest interview with Rap Radar, you pretty much know what this is about. And I'm making this video kind of to shift through the debris and let y'all know, like, to me, what were the most important parts or what gave me the most insight into the way Drake thinks. Because most of the other stuff is stuff that I don't really care about. This is actually one of the first times that clips on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook and wherever else these clips were spread actually uh, weren't really that far out of context. This is like the first interview I could say you could watch from Drake and be like, oh, well, he said what he said, and then you watch the interview, it's not that far off either. If you care about Drake that much, then watch the entire two hour thing. You definitely won't find any moments of filler. First thing I wanna give Drake props on though in the interview is when he said, you'll never get this, who is this moment ever again. Uh, something that will always and forever be foreign to Drake for the remainder of his life. There's never going to be a moment or a time where we play Drake and there's going to be somebody in the car or somebody at the function, somebody at the event asking who that is because everyone already knows who that is. Why this is damaging to artists in their career going forward is it puts a huge expectation on them. It puts a huge comparison between their new work and their old work. And anything that falls short of their old work is trash, is garbage. However, you go into someone's music who you have no idea about, you don't have any expectations. You just go in raw and you're like, oh wow, this is surprising. I really enjoy this or I really don't. Artists should revel in that moment because I don't think it'll ever come to them again. And the pressure begins to build from that point. The next thing that hit me in this interview was uh, Drake alluding to the idea of there being a necessity for change in, in, in the rap game. And, and he was right. Pay attention because everything that I'm saying is actually gonna come together in a cohesive way, like every bullet point that I have. He says, I could make music for dusty guys. Now, Joe Button should definitely get props for his mood music and everything else that he's pretty much done when it comes to emo rap. However, emotional rap can be conveyed in more ways than just ideas and, and lyrics, right? Your emotions can be conveyed through singing your emotions can be conveyed through melody and that's something that was missing from rap music for a really long time i'm not saying that drake was the first and only artist to do something like this but for those of you who keep saying that oh drake didn't do anything new there have been artists that rap and sung before none of those artists were called soft bitches none of those artists were made fun of for singing in their rap songs none of them so why was it that drake was well because he sang because he rapped and sung about his emotions about his relationship issues and I uh, was foreign to mainstream rap for a long time. All, all it was about was I use women for this. I use women as tools. I shoot people. I rob people. I do this. I get money. That's what mainstream rap was. So the next mainstream wave that began to come out was someone that was a little bit more emotionally aware and forthcoming with how he felt. This was expressed in more than just ideas. It was expressed through his harmonies through his vocals and when he says he doesn't really want to make music for dusty guys he means those people that give themselves value through the music that they listen to guys that talk about Kai and Rock Marciano and Euro Droog and MF Doom like they're the only rappers that can give you any type of joy or entertainment in this world like you're realistically laying pipe to Rock Marciano's intros if you are you nasty you need to be in jail you need to be shot imagine riding in the whip with your girl and you got Benny the Butcher playing in the back it's just not a good look for you but keep that in mind Drake specifically said I don't really want to make music for dusty guys I like making music for women. Next point that Drake made was about cultural appropriation, right? Now, my issue with Drake in this cultural appropriation take is, for one, it's been overblown on Twitter because people are making it seem like Drake said that he popularized Afrobeat. And I never heard him say that in the entire interview. Correct me if I'm wrong. I never heard him say that or allude to it. Drake does defend his use of uh, these cultures and these sounds by saying, it's not cultural appropriation because I give credit to the original. I support the original and I also give, uh, you know, the artists that are participating in that content a platform. How can you appropriate a culture that you're paying homage to? Especially with all the 
rap and hip hop elitists that want to say that uh, hip hop and rap is just this original thing, like it wasn't introduced off the back of funk and, and disco and, and soul music samples. To say that these sounds never existed before hip hop is ridiculous. They use the sounds that already existed, that were already popular in the outside world. America and Americans in general are just late to the party every single time we're late when it comes to music. Americans are late to everything. So you cannot sit here and call Drake a cultural appropriator and not say the entire rap game didn't start based off cultural appropriation. What Drake needs to understand though about his stance on cultural appropriation is just because you are paying homage to a culture does not mean that you got permission from the pioneers of that genre of music. And even if you do, it's not always a good look. You putting something on a mainstream pedestal is only gonna further devalue it. Making something more popular is the worst thing to do if you're trying to add value to it. Now, does Drake make dancehall? Of course, of course he does. Does he make good dancehall? No. Does he make unique dancehall? No. So what value are you adding to a genre of music that was already popping before you and have only decided to add more to the pop infested version of it? The same thing happens with artists that are newly discovered all the time. People want them to be underground. People want them to be in closed spaces because the second everyone discovers them, they then start losing their value. People from a multitude of places start taking from their sound, start taking from their art. Not saying that Drake can't just make the music that he wants to make. I'm just saying this is why it doesn't always add value to it. This is one of the reasons why people disrespect pop music so much. It's one of the reasons R&B just as a genre has had such a huge problem making a statement over the last few years because of so many people's infatuation with adding trap music to it. R&B singers becoming rappers, instrumentals sapping literally the soul out of their R&B. Now do I think Drake specifically helped popularize things like Afrobeat? No. Do I think that people learned more about Afrobeat from Drake's use of something that is you know, similar to it on tracks like One Dance. Yeah, I think more people probably look into it based off of more people discussing it because I never heard anybody really in the in the mainstream vein really talk about Afrobeat until Wale and Drake. So all these like woke people like, oh, I've been listening to African music my whole, like, no, you haven't, my guy. And I mean in America, in a mainstream sense, I'm sure there are people that have been listening to these artists for a very long time. Okay, so let's establish that point. America is, is late to most things, music included. The fourth thing that Drake talks about in this interview that also gave me pause was wishing that his achievements were celebrated as a black man. Now these next few points are probably gonna be the most damning in this whole Drake interview. Wishing his achievements were celebrated more from the black community. He mentions at one point in this interview that nobody said that it was a wonderful thing that a black artist like Drake got the uh, artist of the decade achieved. And he said he took notice to it. He looked a little slighted. He looked a little upset. He looked a little hurt. He looked a little upset. But for those of you who watched the remainder of the interview, you know that prior to that, only a few minutes before, Drake literally says, I don't talk about issues that affect us that much. I like to be 10 toes down. I like to go into the cities. I like to be in the streets. I like to make my mark through action. I like to help people through school. I like to build schools. I like to put people in programs. Cool. He doesn't like posting and posturing as if he's this woke guy on social media trying to get points from other people, but at the end of the day, not really doing anything. Cool, Drake. But I don't see you do much like anyway when it comes to black people and dealing with police and systemic racism and everything. I don't see that too much from you anyway. Not saying that you're a bad person if you wanted to just stay out of the way, but you're making it seem like you're not being celebrated as a black man because you're light skinned when in reality, that's not the case at all. I think you're not being as celebrated when it comes to this achievement from the black community because you don't talk about anything black in your music. Okay, and I'm not saying that to be like mean or try to, you know, do this racial divide, but he mentioned it in this interview, so I'm gonna speak on it. You made it a point in this interview to say that you don't like to get political, you don't like to posture on social media intellectually as if you have this higher knowledge or understanding of your surroundings, but at the end of the day, not doing anything. You make it a point not to discuss any of this stuff in your music. You make it a point not to talk about black issues at all, really. Your music is primarily about you, right? So if Kendrick Lamar or if a J. Cole or if a Jay-Z would have gotten this Artist of the Decade Award, people 
that are black probably would celebrate it more because these are artists that talk about it a lot in their music. These are artists that talk about the effects of racism a lot in their music. These are artists that have actually been ten, to to ten toes down and you can see them helping their community a lot. Even 21 Savage has a whole little program he's doing in Atlanta. I saw Jay-Z putting checks in people's hands, helping them with lawyer fees, supplying new lawyers, you know, Meek Mill. So at the end of the day, no one's like, purposefully not celebrating Drake because he's of a lighter shade. It's just, you don't talk about that, so why would they celebrate you for that? I think we've grown or evolved to a point as a society that we don't just celebrate you being black anymore. We celebrate your achievements as a black person, but also if you do things for a black community. Like, I mean, it's, it's more than just being born a race. You don't just get accolades and support from your community by default because that's like saying every black person is good, every black person is thorough, and they're not. Barack Obama, a bunch of people voted for him because he was black. What did he do when he got in office and spent some time in there? Obamacare. Niggas learn. Ironically enough, the only people Drake mentions he has issues with in this very interview are black. Not saying that that's a racial issue, but I'm just saying it goes in line with what Pusha T is going to end up saying, or what ended up being said about Drake. Next point, Drake talks tough, right? His tough talk is really believable. And when he's talk when he's talking about uh you know the issues that he had with other celebrities when he was talking about oh like you know I could let this go to a certain point or I'm going to let my man do 10 you know 5 2 2 3 4 5 years in prison because of something that I just did and I believe him. I was always all oh, the way I was brought up was you never put a gun in shaky hands. You never put uh, a nervous man at the center of decision making because they always make mistakes. They always fuck up. They always leave a little detail. They always screw up somehow. So I 100% believe Drake. Nervous men are the most paranoid people in the world. Paranoid people do not think rationally, okay? So I believe Drake when he said he had, like, he was alluding basically to having a violent mindset. He was alluding to wanting to do something to the people that were sliding him. Y'all could think that he's joking or that he's trying to posture as if he's tough as much as he want. To me, I think him just admitting that is him saying that he was scared. And people that are scared don't think straight. People that are scared make dumb decisions, right? So that's what he was alluding to. So all the people that are saying, oh, Drake's soft. He's trying to act like he's hard. No, he's actually being very transparent. Do not leave the trigger in the hands of a man who is nervous, who is paranoid, who is afraid. Now, for probably the most interesting part of the entire interview is when he starts talking about Pusha T and when he eventually ends up talking about Kanye, which isn't that interesting at all, really. Pusha T, he's saying that the diss was only popular pretty much because he revealed information. He had secret intel, like these loose documents that revealed Drake to be a father, and that's the whole reason that Drake ended up being clowned, when he's like, you really gotta be disingenuous and like have a huge lack of self-awareness to not see that the entirety of the diss was based in you as a man, not you as a father. Like, no one looked at this and said, oh man, Drake, he, he had a son, oh man, let's shit on him. Like, no, nobody was looking at you like that. They were looking at you like that because it's like, you are the exact thing that you've preached that your dad was to you. The entire diss, Pusha T goes on to reveal the type of person you are. Pusha T's diss is much more layered than Drake's diss. Not saying that Drake's diss didn't have better wordplay and it wasn't a more palatable song. He cut like artery deep. This goes back into my point about why Drake wouldn't be celebrated as a black man. How are you gonna be celebrated as a black man when you add to the absentee father statistic? That was another thing that Pusha T was trying to push in that, wow, that's funny, that was trying to push in that diss record, right? So already, on, I think on my point number four, point number three, I said, you know, uh, Drake wants to be celebrated uh, from the black community for his achievements being a black man. Pusha T's diss says that you shouldn't be celebrated as a man or as a black man, adding to the absent father statistic. Now, Drake might not be an absent father, but that's not Pusha T's problem. He's trying to prove a point, regardless of if some of the information is accurate or not. Like the first thing he put was an image of you in blackface. That goes to how you are viewed and portrayed as a black man. The fact that you would even be willing to do that. Number three, my cultural appropriation point. Pusha T is also saying you emulate cultures and you devalue them just like white people used to. You're the same. You're not a black man. This is all in line with Pusha T's entire point, right? Drake is literally proving Pusha T's point in his diss record doing this interview. My point number two, when Drake says, I can make music for dusty men. I can make music for dusty guys. Pusha T alluded to you not being a real MC because of the fact that 
you had help writing a couple lines on your if this, if you're reading this is too late record i don't know how many i'm not saying it invalidates you and everything that you've done good in your career i'm just saying this is what pusha t is trying to say he's saying you're a lesser mc because you don't prioritize the methods of an mc and drake you haven't for a while you know let's not be disingenuous here also adding to my number two point is drake puts these guys these people from other countries that are black on like these poster cards and yes he helps them yes they get a look yes they get more exposure yes they get more popularity but the way he advertises them is very much like those infomercials that you see randomly popping up on your screen showing kids in africa that if you donate a dollar or two they'll have another meal like the way it comes across i'm sure pusha t had that in mind the way you put these cultures on display is very opportunistic right and most of the time He's inspired by something because it was a hit. Now, one point about Drake that I love that he mentioned in this interview was he didn't want to participate further in the nastiness. Uh, he says at one point he looked at some of the things that he was saying in the disc record that most people be believe to be uh, imaginary. And, you know, I do too, but at the same time, I'll let Drake have this one because it might, it might be real. Uh, but when he says... I didn't want to look back at something, you know, that I did two years ago and say, I'm not proud of the person that said that. We all got to remember what Eminem said about his mother on cleaning out my closet. Years and years and years later, Eminem came out with a with a response to that record. Uh, I don't remember the name of that record, but he was talking about in the record that he released years and years after the cleaning out my closet record, that he was ashamed of everything that he said in those lines. He was ashamed of the song that he made. He was ashamed that the song had even come out right so he wasn't proud of the person that was saying what that person was saying even though most people that listen to cleaning him cleaning out my closet championed him for saying what he was saying he was ashamed for saying what he was saying and if this is one of the reasons that drake doesn't want to participate in the nastiness meaning it adds further to his point that he likes music that's real and that's authentic he would be a fan of music that is is, is true to someone's spirit not just a random outburst of anger or a random out of character moment if drake doesn't want to participate in the nastiness of rap and how far it can go that's fine i think he should stick to things that he's more comfortable with i don't want people to lose pieces of themselves trying to prove something to other MCs based off of the spectators which is comprised mainly of like teenagers that live in the suburbs you're altering the person that you are for kids online to say ooh and ah that's not the type of person you are that's fine honestly I gotta look myself in the mirror I gotta look my peers in the face I gotta look at my family I gotta look at my son so when he says he's not a fan of music he doesn't believe if you can't believe that these things are going to come out of you even though they do and you don't want them to ever be released that's fine i understand that that's that's okay at the end of the day people need to understand that this rap game should not alter the type of person that you are if it's if it starts to you need to stop that's the downfall of rappers as it is letting this persona take over their personal life letting it take over their actual being and then they don't know how to separate who they are versus who they're trying to be for entertainment that's what you don't want to do. You don't want to lose yourself. And last but not least, Drake talks about relationships at a point in this interview. And he talks about them in a way that also alludes to Pusha T's point, unfortunately, and to my perception of him as a father when he says that he loves his space, when he says that he doesn't like to compromise, when he says that he doesn't want to come out of his routine. It kind of makes sense. I mean, not to say that you were trying to do anything fishy when it comes to being a father even though a lot of people are going to make their jokes about that um it's more about yeah you don't want to compromise you don't want to give time you don't want to you know divvy up your routine you also have to do that with a child you also have to do that with your son so drake was forced into a fatherhood position he so his space was invaded his routine was ruined the thing about parents is they unintentionally take out their frustration with their routine being ruined on the child because it's now their responsibility to take care of this person whereas if it's a relationship you can just leave this person high and dry and not really care that much about it in the long run also adding to push a t's point because if you end up not having the best relationship with your son because you didn't want your routine interrupted this is also the same thing that you kind of talked about with your dad there were certain compromises that he wasn't willing to make because he didn't want his routine altered drake talked about that a lot in his music so what did pusha t do pusha t in a disc record that was made almost two years ago well a year and a half ago pusha t showed the world why drake shouldn't be celebrated as a black man and drake literally in this interview a year and a half later goes on to confirm 
while complaining about not being celebrated as a black man, why he ultimately should not be celebrated as a black man. There were a lot of moments in the video where Drake seemed visibly upset. He seemed visibly irritated. Uh, not to say that he was upset with the interviewers, because I'm sure they, I mean, they were doing a great job to me. Uh, going into questions that were a little bit more uncomfortable. He wasn't a fan at all of Pusha T, but he still got his signed microphone upstairs in his room. Like, don't you have a tattoo of like the Beatles on you or something too? Like, you need to stop idolizing folks, right? Because maybe if you didn't, you wouldn't have this fall so hard. He says he's not a fan of Pusha T because he's not a fan of like rappers that don't live the life that they live in their music but I don't remember or recall a time in Pusha T's discography where there was something that was said that was made to be like significantly bigger than it actually was. I feel like you allow your perception of his music at that time, since you idolize people so, so much and so regularly, I feel like you allow your perception to become the reality when if you listen to Pusha T's lines, I mean, I don't think too much of it is so unrealistic. Sure, it's put in a way that's supposed to be interpreted in a bit more of an entertaining way, but I don't think it's anything that's like too far off the mark. If anything, you should have had enough common sense and wherewithal to either not be a fan because you didn't want him inf affecting and infecting communities and then spreading the rhetoric around later, or shut up and still listen to his music and just accept the fact that he bested you in a rat beef. But that's how I'm feeling about the interview. Uh, those are the most important parts to me anyway, what I got out of it, what I took from it. Uh, Y'all feel free to let me know how you felt about it in the comment section down below if you watch the entirety of the two hours. And uh, yeah, hopefully we're going to get a good Drake album in 2020. I've got my hopes up. I feel like this could be something special. I really do. And and that's that's really it. You know, thanks for watching. And uh, yeah, I'll see I'll see y'all next time. And I'm out. I'm holding my crotch right now like one hand like a rapper.